Good evening. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum at the Institute of Politics. My name is Ryan Don Nguyen. I'm a sophomore studying history and literature and government at the college, and I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. We want to acknowledge that Harvard University is located on the traditional land of the Massachusetts people, and the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag nations have long been our neighbors as well. Harvard Kennedy School recognizes and honors the past, present, and future of these indigenous people and precious lands. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located on both the park side and the JFK street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit nearest to you and congregate in the JFK park. Now please take a moment to silence your cell phones. Great. Now please take your seats and join me in welcoming Dr. Grace Gomez. She's the Assistant Director of Advocacy at Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, so just briefly, the goal of the advocacy office is to connect, align, and strengthen national anti-racist movement efforts. And one strategy that we use to accomplish this goal is convening critical conversations at the intersection of academia and activism to ensure the voices of community organizers and social movement builders are prioritized in the space. We had the great good fortune of collaborating with Executive Director of Native Organizers Alliance and current IOP fellow, Judith LeBlanc, on tonight's film screening and discussion. We'll begin our time together with a short film, First Light, which documents the systematic removal of indigenous children from their families and kinship networks and tells the story of an experiment with truth-telling and healing for the Wabanaki people and child welfare workers in Maine. After the film, we'll have a conversation and close with question and answer. Thank you, and now first light. Imagine you're about to have a little one. The love that you have for that little one. And then imagine somebody outside of your family you don't even know making claims on your little one. They don't like the way you live. And they're going to take your little one by force. But imagine what the loss is when this is not just your family, but your entire community loses its children. My people's continued existence depends on children being able to be who they are and know who they are that um, transfer of knowledge to generations, cultural knowledge, spiritual knowledge, you know, those things that make us who we are. You know, they look at us, they look at you, and they reflect. This is the way I'm supposed to be. Congress gives money to start boarding schools, to forcibly remove Native children as young as four and five years old from their homes and their communities, bring them thousands of miles away to an institution 
um, where they're forbidden to speak their language, forbidden to communicate with each other. seen as very progressive and had a lot of support and that filtered its way into the child welfare system you know native children are better off raised in white homes you know let's save those poor Indian kids up not knowing even if they're Native American. It's not just about removing children, it's dismantling everything of their being in the process. That cultural assimilation and to kill the Indian to save the man, to kill the Indian in that child. Child Welfare Act in 1978 was an atonement. The premise of the Indian Child Welfare Act was not to forcibly remove the children from their families, but find ways within the community, within the families, to keep them there. This law was passed and Maine in particular still had one of the highest rates of removal of Native children. We have people who are still disconnected from our communities because they were taken when they were little. We have young people in foster care now that have a story to tell. Next on Maine Watch, coming to terms with the past, Maine has become the first state in the nation to form a Truth and Reconciliation Commission focusing on child welfare. The ceremony creating the Maine Wabanaki State Child Welfare Truth and Reconciliation Commission mandate took place at the State House in the Hall of Flags. As the five tribal chiefs and Governor LePage sat down to sign the mandate, they took with them the words of Denise Altvater, who herself had been taken as a child. It's time for truth, it's time for healing, it's time for peace, and it's time for forgiveness. When they took you, did they tell you why? They never told us anything. They to just this, took you? To this day, I don't know why. The people who ran the home, I used to say that they abused us, and I now realize what they did was torture us, hmm. um, sexually abused us. You know, no one ever believes that any of this stuff ever happened. For well, one thing, nobody ever really talked about it. But to know that there's going to be a special commission, a place, a time, so that you can tell your story, and that they are going to believe you that it really happened, and then it's going to make a really big difference. It's going to change things. I think that is so powerful. commissioners mandated to discover what the truth is.
Many of our people have never shared their stories. It's a total contradiction to silence. The truth hurts. The truth is very painful, very painful for us. It's the families themselves who decided to walk through the fear and to tell what happened that are making history. They're the ones making history, not us, the commissioners. We were in Indian Township meeting with the community and this woman just spoke up. How do you propose that we're supposed to be healing? When we went through that experience, we experienced that alone. We experienced it in isolation. And we kept it that way. And then when we open it, if we open it and we're with each other, that's how we can heal amongst the circle of our relatives. I can't get over the, the nightmares. All we did was beg for our foster mother to hug us and say they loved us. My baby sister and I sat in the tub of bleach one time try to convince each other that we're getting white. And then we knew they would accept us. Where was the state? Where was the state that was supposed, they were supposed to have been our guardians. But where were they? They weren't there for us, but we didn't know. We knew nothing else but foster people. And how come it took so long for you all to get a group together to see if they can help us. You can't heal someone that's gone through hell. When we tell it, we feel it in our bodies, we feel it in our spirit, we feel it in our heart. But I also believe that we can get to that point where it has far less power over us. Part of the fear of sharing what happened to you is you relive some of that pain and by her doing what she did, she showed them that you could share it and come back. That's the perfect example of the readiness that it's time. We witnessed over the last 27 months the incredible strength of the Wabanaki people. The people of the dawn, the people of the first light. Our essential finding is that between 2002 and 2013, Native children in Maine were still five times more likely to enter foster care than non-Native children. We take these essential numbers, the disproportionate rates of removal over time, the gaps in identification, and we link them to still present realities of racism and dispossession, and we frame them as evidence of continued cultural genocide against Wabanaki people. acknowledge exactly what this is about, then we can start the process of healing. Then we can start the process of change.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Judith LeBlanc. I'm a citizen of the Caddo Nation. I'm a grandma, or as, as we say in Caddo, I'm an Ika. And I'm the executive director of the Native Organizers Alliance. And I would like to invite my relatives to come. Come, please. We are so excited um, that we will be having this conversation with you tonight as a, a way to help you interpret what will happen at the Supreme Court later this week when arguments are heard around the legality and the constitutionality of the Indian Child Welfare Act. And so we are in a moment where for Native peoples we have a greater visibility than we ever have. We have the first Native woman who is leading the first time ever the Department of Interior, the most important government department for us. Yes. In that department, there are our, our health care, our housing, our governance, the management of water and land, as well as endangered species are all in one department. And we have a, a Native woman who understands from her own experience what is necessary in Indian country, what is necessary in this country in order to respond uh, to the threat to a multiracial democracy. When, when, in fact, when in fact we have families who now are really under threat, under threat, and the Indian Child Welfare Act, after 44 years, has proven to be a very successful way of ensuring that tribal nations have their constitutional right guaranteed. We'll hear a little bit tonight about, about what the Indian Child Welfare Act is, what its history is, the impact, and then we're going to, to have kind of a call to action, have a conversation with all of you about how you can be good relatives and help to ensure that cultural continuity of tribal nations and the sovereign status that we, that we have is guaranteed into the future. Most of you probably don't know that we're dual citizens. Most Indians describe themselves as being a citizen of their nation and a citizen of the United States. And so we're going to explore the duality of being uh, dual citizens in the United States and what that entails in the 21st century. So our panel, April Fournier, she's a Navajo and is the National Program Manager for Advanced Native Political Leadership, which is a partner, sister organization of my own organization, the Native Organizers Alliance. She'll tell you a little bit about their work. She is currently serving as a city council member, the only native in elected office in Portland, Maine, in the state of Maine, and she is serving on the Portland City Council. Chris Newell, Passamaquoddy Nation. He is the tribal community member in residence at Yukon and the director of education at the Akamawit Educational Initiative. Okay, good. Close is good for me, especially with the Boston accent. Chris was the senior advisor on Donlan and is also, also has a new book out, which he'll tell you about. Sandra Whitehawk. Sandra, welcome. Sakanju Lakota. She is, she's Sikanju from the Sikanju Lakota, you did good. Well, it's because my second home is uh, the Osheti Shikon. I lived there for one year, 1973-74. Got a lot, a lot of stories to tell. We gotta get together, Sandy. Yes, yes. She's the founder and director of the Nations Reparation Institute. Sandra served as a commissioner for the Maine Wabanaki State Child Welfare Truth and Reconciliation Commission and served as an honorary witness of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission on residential schools in Canada. And then we have Dr. Mishi Lesser. She's the learning director for Upstander Project 
and an Emmy Award-winning researcher. Mishi has authored Upstander Project's many learning and viewer guides and is a Strassler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies affiliate. So let's get this conversation started. So the context. What's the context? Let's set the context for our, for our audience, both here in the room and online. On November 9th, the Supreme Court is going to hear uh, uh, the case against uh, the Indian Child Welfare Act. They will, it is considered, in Indian country, the biggest challenge that we have faced, not only Native American families, but really to cultural continuity in a multiracial democracy. From the moment the US was founded, family separation has been a policy that's been used in slavery and even yet still for immigrants. There's no other way you can explain why children were put into cages at the border in the last two years and why family separation continues to be a policy to try to stem migration, which is a very natural thing to happen. It has happened all through, through human history. So what has been the impact of Indian Child Welfare Act? It's very hard for us to say Indian Child Welfare Act because we always say ikwa, ikwa. We, we talk in shorthand about this because it's been in existence for 44 years. What's been the impact during those 44 years? Why is it being challenged now? And why does it matter to everyone, not just Indian families? Are you just gonna go yeah. on? <laughs> no, I'm gonna let all, yeah, this is the Hunger Games. You all decide. Uh, well, I'm happy to start. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Um, so, yet a, so good to see all of you. Thank you for coming. Really, this is, um, the visibility piece is critical to protecting things like ICWA uh, and things like tribal sovereignty. So just getting to know our stories and getting to then share our stories out to your communities is eventually going to be our call to action at the end. But um, this is very personal for me because my mom um, was taken from the Navajo reservation when she was four. And so her and her baby sister um, were living in Ganado in Arizona and my grandmother um, became sick with tuberculosis. And her oldest child, Stephen, was away at boarding school because that's what good Navajos did. They sent their children off to be educated. Um, and the government came in and told my grandmother, you're, you're very sick, let us take your daughters. We'll take care of them, and once you're better, we'll bring them back to you. Um, 30 years later, she was able to recover and find her family, but not before they were given to a white couple from Iowa who then moved them to uh, California and raised them in Simi Valley. Um, and so my mother lost her language, she lost her culture, and lost her access to her family for more than 30 years. And it was the universe really giving that relationship back. She just happened to see in a Native American magazine uh, an individual, uh, Stephen Darden, who was a judge at the time uh, in Navajo Nation that looked a lot like her. And in her mind, she remembered that name, and they were able to reconnect and be reunited. Um, but what she would have learned had she stayed with her family, had she stayed within her culture, she would have been able to pass to me and to my sister, and we would have been able to pass to our children. Um, we are now on a reconnecting journey together and have been uh, my entire life, and I'm so grateful to do the work that I do. But if ICWA were in place when my mother was a child. She would have been able to be given um, temporary custody or to another member of the tribe, the aunties, the uncles, the other relatives that lived in her community, and she would have been able to keep that relationship instead of trying to overcome the trauma that she did for all of those years. Um, even now, she'll hear songs or she'll hear a phrase, and it, it's a physical reaction that just impacts her so deeply. It's a connection she just hasn't been able to fix. Um, but for me, it's personal. So as soon as we hear this challenge to this law that has helped Native families, 
Um, that sounds all the alarm bells, and that's why I'm so grateful we're having this conversation today. Thank you, Thank Judith. You. Thank you so much, April. Um, I would like I'll to jump in on just the historical aspects. Um, Indian child removal is, is something that's, you know, born into the creation of this country. It existed prior to this country. Um, and it's not just Indian child removal, but, you know, enslavement amongst other things. But um, it, it all comes down to a lot of the same things. Uh, I mean, even Harvard University uh, was founded, uh, you know, to Christianize Native people. Uh, you know, the first Bible that was ever printed in this country was printed by a man named John Eliot. And it was not printed in English, it was printed in Algonquin for the purpose of once again Christianizing natives. Um, there's always been, uh, since the founding of America, an idea that since we are non-Christian peoples that uh, a segment of uh, you know, America has always felt that we needed to be saved. And I mention this history because the, the threads of it actually you know, are extended into the current case that we have going on right now. <clears throat> So, I mean, there, there's definitely that part of it, but there's also uh, the creation of the United States, uh, the expansion of the country, the want of land, the need of land, and the extraction of the resources of land that America built itself off of. Um, that's also a big part of the story of what we're seeing today as well. Um, and so that required uh, the elimination of native peoples. And so different, uh, throughout history, American policy has created different vehicles for doing so. Um, and one of which is the Indian residential school system, but you also hear about the Indian Ado Adoption Project, which was a literal thing in the 1950s where the US federal government was finding Native children and adopting them out to white families for supposedly their better good. Um, and then it eventually, as uh, Esther mentions in the film, filters into the child welfare policy um, and and uh, that still remains, even after the Indian Child Welfare Act in a lot of states, uh, e even today. And uh, it's really about the destruction of Native peoples uh, altogether. Um, it, it really gets down to it. I mean, it, it really sounds like I'm reaching there when I say something as extreme as that. <coughs> However, uh, when you look at the end game of what will uh, happen if uh, you know, the opposing party were to get everything that they wanted, that is essentially the, the future that we're looking at. And so uh, when Judith talks about you know, uh, this being the most important <coughs> case we've seen, um, I mean, I, I've been telling everybody literally everything is at stake for Indian country mm -hmm. right now. Uh, and that's a real thing for us to consider. <coughs> In the beginning, uh, when they made the decision for um, boarding school, that was a financial decision. It became cheaper to send kids to boarding school than it did to wage attack, military attacks on us. That cost money. Then it became cheaper to adopt us out than it did to um, keep us in, in boarding schools. It's, all, it's so often about money and um, power. We're sovereign nations. And the Indian Child Welfare Act is to protect uh, citizens of our sovereign nations. Right now, when there's um, trying to build the argument that ICWA is a race-based law, when the word race isn't even in the law, when you read the Indian Child Welfare Act, the word race isn't even in there. We are citizens. We have a political status. We're dual citizens of the United States and of our respective nations. Sovereignty has been attacked since forever. It's never really been um, respected. It's been established. They had to look at us in some fashion to establish something so that they could take land, so that they could build policy. They had to create uh, all that they created um, but it, it, oh, there's a part of me that just has thought it seems to make like bad sense or evil sense or the land has been taken everywhere we turn, right? What's left? Our children. Removing them and, and um, keeping them from their uh, status and from their... Uh, uh, political uh, entities that seem to be what's next. And so right now, 
Um, and we are our commodity for the adoption industry right now, the adoption business. We are, even though, <laughs> even though we're the cheapest babies, white newborn babies are most sought after, most expensive. And we are the, um, people want us because we're the cheapest, I think. <laughs> It sounds morbid, but we, you know, it's how they're looking at us. I had the um, <clears throat> displeasure of visiting the website of the Goldwater Institute this afternoon. Have you all wow. ever heard of the Goldwater Institute? They are funding the attack on ICWA, among others, um, on behalf of the multi-billion, I said billion, dollar, private adoption industry. And I jotted down something that's um, on their website today, just because I thought it might help illuminate what's really at play here. ICWA imposes cruel burdens on some of the nation's most vulnerable children, depriving them of legal protections that other children enjoy. That's their narrative. Mm. And that's the ideology that is driving this attack, it's profoundly cynical and offensive to suggest that Native children, unless they become white, don't have a future in this country. So it behooves us, all of us, to really lift the hood on this car and understand what is going on. And if there's another really incredible thing about what's going to happen in the Supreme Court this week, the case is being heard on the exact day when President Carter signed ICWA in 1978. Are they aware of, of, of I mean, the lawyers? Um, certainly who are protecting ICWA will point that out. Did you want us to move on? And, to your and it's, no. and excuse me, and it's Native American Heritage Month, mm -hmm. and it's National Adoption Awareness Month. That's right. And it's my birthday on November uh, 9th. <laughs> Sandy. <laughs> I should have a front seat to hear it in person, don't you think? <laughs> You know, I think one thing that we have to look at objectively is that ICWA is a, the gold standard of child protective services. It's the gold standard. Why? Because it gives tribes the first opportunity to support a child, to take the child, to have extended family or community take the child in. That's the gold standard. It's the first option before the state child protective services makes plans. So that it, it, it's kind of, it's in a basic sense, an act of sovereignty. We have a unique legal status because we sign treaties with the US government. Those treaties are guaranteed by the constitution. Only an act of Congress can change treaties. And those treaties gave us the right to govern our own lands, our resources, to construct and, and to, to continue to live as a cultural and political entity. And so what this case does is threaten the very constitutionality of treaties, treaties signed that were, are guaranteed by the Constitution. Although the right wing challenges ICWA as being unconstitutional. The irony. I know there are some Harvard Law students here who will be sitting in the courtroom, and we're going to rely on them the day after to give us some commentary about what the arguments were for and against. So I'm hoping you'll, you'll not just ask a question, but contribute uh, to why it is that we should all care about the fate of ICWA. So if ICWA is reversed, Sandy, I know that you're working nationally and you are 
you are plugged into kind of the national ecosystem of people that are preparing for the outcome. If ICWA is reversed, what's at stake? What, should, what can be done? The first thing I want to say, I want to back up just a moment about um, the gold standard. The other piece of ICWA, which floors me that social workers don't want to do it. Uh, ICWA, all, the, the, uh, there's reasonable efforts that every social worker is expected to do to help any family reunite. And then there are active efforts under the Indian Child Welfare Act. That means you must leave the building, basically. <laughs> Find resources, do the extra, build the relationship to help someone who is in crisis, mend themselves, heal, so that they can reunite. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know why social workers wouldn't want to do that for every family. Every family deserves that kind of effort for them to heal and parent their children. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the that part, to me, is like the gold standard, other than having the tribe in, uh, intervene. And then I also wanted to, I just have to add, I don't know of any real, any treaties that have been really upheld. There's been about 500 of them and I don't know, uh, I guess the law students could find that out, but I don't think any one of them really has, there's always been something changed within that because that's the power differential that the United States government imposes on us. But what will happen if it was not here, I'm not a law person, but what I hear my law people say is it will um, it it will impact all of Indian federal law or federal Indian law, all the other laws that we have relationships that we have because to say this is unconstitutional again goes back to our sovereign status and how that's not being upheld, you know, respected or and talked about in this in this case if it is also if it is um dismantled there are state um like minnesota has minnesota indian preservation act that was uh, passed i believe in the late 80s so we are in our training our workers right now i i train for um, the tribal training certificate uh, program here in minnesota and we're um, our teams are telling us that they are gearing up to uh, boost that. And also we're, we've trained BIPFA right along with ICWA so that they understand and know uh, there'll still be a, a, an active effort that they are going to have to give for our families. And several states have um, their own ICWA laws that will at least have that. In the course of uh, the implementation of ICWA, all over Indian country, states like Minnesota, North Carolina, several states pass laws that close the gaps between the federal law and, and the state child protective services, which meant that the tribes had representation and a voice in trying to ensure that our children were treated in a good way. So what do you think? What do you all think? What, what shall we do if it's reversed? Where, where's the responsibility for taking action? What, what mm. do our relatives here need to consider? I think from my perspective, it's having, having a voice and having a vote in any of these. So if we can't rely on the federal courts, we know that we also need to have local elected officials in local judgeships in state legislature in state senate and governor positions and the only way that we're going to have a voice and have a vote is if we learn how to run for office because the system wasn't built for us and so all of your tr political training programs don't necessarily take into consideration all of the hardships that we encounter when we go into these spaces to try and take back power, to try and have a voice, to try and challenge the status quo. So I think the first, the first thing that we can do is really mobilize to run for office, to take these positions, not only these political positions uh, as leaders, but also water boards, utility boards, land bank commissions. Those are where our voices need to be. And so we need to have a vote at that table in order to protect these at the state level or at the local level. 
And I, I just want to uh, say, uh, thanking uh, Seti Warren, the uh, interim director of the Institute of Politics here at the Kennedy School for giving us this space and opportunity to have this conversation. Because I think that there are a number of graduate students here. I think that a place like the Harvard Kennedy School, you all need to be having discussions about the impact of ICWA on public policy. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to study and have open, clear discussion about why it is that tribal sovereignty should be impacting public policy mm -hmm. on a state level, mm -hmm. on a federal level. If it's not being done here, where will it be done? Mm -hmm. So I think that, that this is an important conversation that we're going to be having for quite some time because mm -hmm. if, if it was chipped away, the responsibility, as April's saying, will fall into the hands of those who are developing policies and working with child protective services on a state level. Mm -hmm. And it will fall into the hands to city council people like April mm -hmm. to respond to the crisis of Native children being, being separated from their extended family. Nishi. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind is that ICWA was born out of a social movement. It was born out of women, mostly, aunties, grandmothers, mothers, sisters, sharing the agony of having their children taken from them. It wasn't a. It wasn't born in the Senate. <laughs> it was brought to the Senate in 1974. Our film, Dawnland, opens with that scene, mm -hmm. with footage of some of the first women who came forward to tell their stories. If ICWA gets demolished in this moment, I think clearly the states mm -hmm. are going to be under enormous pressure to create stronger mm -hmm. laws. And that pressure needs to come from a new social movement. Just like the Maine Wabanaki State Child Welfare Truth and Reconciliation Commission, well, it wasn't an idea that the former and wants to be again governor of Maine, Paul LePage, came up with. No, it was mostly women, not only, <coughs> exerting pressure because of the agony that they had experienced. So I think we have to we have to we have to thread the role of pressure and social movements into our thinking. And I think we have to have and this is a hard thing to say because the agony continues and I don't want to say this lightly, but we this is going to be a, a, a long process of building power at the local level, at the state level. And one thing that Chris and I have talked about but we haven't been able to act on, is there anybody here from the ed school? All right, I'm looking at you. <laughs> we need a curriculum for children yes. here now that teaches them that ICWA came out of social protest. Our children, I mean, because the truth is being taken from them, right? We, so many teachers who are on front lines are being reprimanded or losing jobs or threatened if they teach the truth. That's a separate issue I wish we had more time to talk about. But children need to learn this history. It's, a, it's foundational to the history of the past century into this century. So we need to create a curriculum about that. <laughs> um, and then the other piece of this is social workers. Are there any social workers in the room? Okay, we have a couple. We have to transform how your colleagues are educated. There's so much unlearning that needs to happen. And in first light, I mean, it's just a 13-minute film. If you watch Dawnland, you'll get more of a sense of the struggle of social workers to transform themselves and how hard a time they have seeing themselves in this story of change and not sort of embracing the ideology of white supremacy. 
we have to help them. We have to bring them into a process of transformation. And as we do that, I think we will be setting foundations for stronger laws at the state level. And there will be, there'll be another federal law when April succeeds in building you know, political operatives and candidates nationwide. So we have to play the long game if the worst happens. Um, I'll just say protect tribal sovereignty at all levels. You, you don't have to be in government to do so. Um, just if you become a teacher in a classroom, right, the education that you teach, you know, if the, the material that you get it from, um, intellectual property is sovereign property of, you know, the cultures where it comes from and treat it that way. Um, but that's just one thing because of what's at stake here. It, it really does have to go even beyond that because um, one of the things that, that um, th this has been long time in coming. Uh, there were several test cases that happened before, baby Veronica, baby Lexi, um, you know, eventually the Brackeen case. And every single time they attack the law as if it was race-based. Um, and as you've heard, uh, you know, uh, Indian is a legal status uh, that, ha that shows political status as citizens of sovereigns within the United States. Um, so therefore, we have a government-to-government -government relationship with the United States. Um, so they have tried several cases. Every time they tried the race-based argument, it got shot down until in Texas, a judge, which uh, in his particular district has no tribes, no federally recognized tribes whatsoever, agreed that it was a race-based law, therefore it was unconstitutional because of racial discrimination. So precedent that had been set, you know, for well over a hundred years was overturned just because of the belief of the judge, because of the bad education and history that he had, right? And so by protecting tribal sovereignty at all levels, including in education, right, we start to produce judges that don't make this mistake and get us to where we are at this argument was used by uh, the opponents of, of the United States from it because the Fifth Circuit shot it down more than once. However, now that they're in front of the Supreme Court, they get to throw it back out there again. And we do not know what this court will say when that yeah. happens. If we are, if it is determined to be a race-based law under the Supreme Court, that essentially undoes tribal tw uh, Title 25, which is federal Indian law, which recognizes the sovereignty, the nation, the government-to-government -government relationship, our government's preceding the United States government. Um, and once again, the history that you know, can be taught here, the uh, sovereignty of Americans was first recognized by Wabanaki chiefs in the Treaty of Watertown in 1776, not by the country of France. All right, it was by native people. Native people recognized the ability of Americans to govern themselves while they lived here on this land. That's a historical fact, right? And so if we were to have a Supreme Court that would do this, they go against history, they go against precedent, they undo a whole lot of things, and it destroys a future for my children and their children going forward. So. Questions, conversation. I know some of the law students are here. Something to add to the gumbo that we've created. Could you go to the mic? People can uh, line up at the mics. Um, and if you will say your name, your relationship to Harvard, and um, state a question, or if you want to add some more information that we may not have been able to cover. So please. I'm Tessa Faust, and I am a Master of Theological Studies student at the Divinity School with a focus on Native religion and culture from the Winnebago tribe, Ho-Chunk Nation. Uh, so I was curious about, we keep talking about how ICWA, if this gets shot down in the Supreme Court, how this will undermine a lot of federal policy and sovereignty. I'm wondering how it's in relation to the recent Oklahoma case with the reservation. I know a lot of people have been afraid in Indian country of using that law and policy to do more because of afraid of backlash. Do you think this could be a stream of backlash in Indian rights and sovereignty? Or how does it relate to that law? Sandy. <laughs> 
I don't know if I can do that one. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to say something before I forget. I think Christopher should run for office. <laughs> Chris, I have a program. <laughs> He would be he would be awesome, and if I wished I lived out there, because I'd be I'd be I'd campaign for him. <laughs> um, I don't feel equipped to answer that, and um, also want to greet you, Ho Chunk uh, person, because uh, being Lakota, we're cousins, so to speak, <laughs> and uh, good to good to know that we have uh, one of our relatives out out there in Harvard. But I don't believe I can answer that question very very well. Um, I'll jump in on it because when it comes to this, um, you know, Wabanaki <laughs> peoples in, in the state of Maine have a, a kind of a historical precedent to go with. Uh, the Maine Indian Land Claim Settlement Act was enacted <clears throat> in 1980, and it was essentially a, a land claim um, for what was two thirds of the state of Maine. And the federal government agreed that that land claim was legitimate. And you know, for about a decade, there was negotiation. Um, uh, you know, uh, where e even uh, large land sales could not happen in the state of Maine because there was they couldn't figure out whose land it actually was. Um, and, uh, you know, so a as a result, there definitely was a fear mongering that was put mm -hmm. into the public, um, yeah. you know, a, a, that these Indians are going to take all, they're going to kick you all out of your homes right. and take everything from you. And, you know, and, and that was used very successfully in the public newspapers and everything like that. Um, and it, it ended up really driving the governor to create jurisdictional language, which we're still stuck under today, that really affects our tribal sovereignty um, and uh, was not a fair deal in the end, you know, even though we did settle, um, you know, for um, the, just for the large cases, large pieces of land, not for private pieces of land. So it, it always happens. And in fact, in American pop culture at the time, the case was such a big deal to American pop culture that the idea of Indians getting land back through treaty rights started to show up in pop culture media. Mm -hmm. So poltergeist, right? You know, the Indian burial ground, the, the you know, um, you know, Pet Cemetery, um, Amityville Horror, right? Those stories are becoming pop culture stories. They're very popular at that time in history because of what's happening in the state of Maine. Uh, people literally are, are dreaming up these things, you know, these horror stories as a result of the very real court cases and the fear mongering that was happening in the state of Maine. When it comes to this particular case, going back to the baby Veronica case, Jessica Monday, uh, I mean, they hired a PR firm and they basically went to media companies and places like Dr. Phil show and got to, you know, put the entire narrative that this law is racist, it's horrible for Indian children, all of these types of things unchallenged on these platforms. And, you know, that was detrimental to those cases. It really was, you know, the, the, the public pushback that, that resulted as a result of the successful PR campaign that was launched um, did uh, negatively affect, especially the baby Veronica case. So it does exist, right? And what I would do is encourage you all uh, to look beyond, you know, what the Goldwater Institute puts out there as, you know, just painting themselves as kind of golden boys doing good for Indian country when in fact they don't have any Indian clients, you know, on their clientele uh, to, to uh, subscribe to the same thing. Pay attention to what Native people say about this and lift up those voices. A majority of tribes in this yes. country, a majority of tribes in this country support ICWA because so that they can carry out their ancestral responsibilities to care for community, a fundamental core value, intertribal core value. And I would just say one last thing, and I'll, I'll call on you uh, for your question. You know, the uh, Supreme Court made a series of decisions, including the year it, 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 that I have affirmed over many years um, the constitutionality of sovereignty and treaties. For example, a man was uh, hunting in Montana without a, a state license. The Supreme Court heard the case, and they affirmed his right to hunt there because he was a member of the tribe, and that land was unceded treaty territory. Unceded, meaning it's not currently a part of the reservation. There's a series of affirmations of the role of the sovereign governments as we are dual, dual citizens, we are nations within this nation and recognized in that way by the Constitution. And <clears throat> I think that 
the Supreme Court, you have to follow the money on a lot of these cases, including the affirmative action case uh, that's currently before the court uh, uh, on Harvard and UNC's affirmative action, affirmative action uh, admissions policy, or for that matter, uh, the reversal of Roe versus Wade. And so we, kicking this issue of how to care for our children and ensure cultural continuity and the opportunity for tribes to take care of the community <coughs> means that it's going to be kicked back to states that in the main now are controlled by people who do not see the expansion, uh, state legislators, legislatures that do not see the expansion of democracy as the primary goal. Over 30 states have passed laws to restrict access to voting. So once we go into that territory of sending everything back into the hands of the states, you lose the nature of what is at the heart of this very tattered democracy, and that is the Constitution. So your question, your name, your affiliation with Harvard? Uh, my name is Brian O'Connor. My relationship with Harvard is troubled. I was an yeah. undergraduate here, and thank you so much for coming, and thanks to the IOP. 48 years ago, I went to the old IOP building on Mount Auburn Street, and I saw Tom Tureen and a group of Passamaquoddies and other members of the Native American Rights Fund talk exactly about what Chris was mentioning, the 1980 settlement. This was years before the settlement. But uh, my question is really about the ICWA, and assuming it does survive, it has not, as you know well, always protected and is not currently protecting a lot of native children from mm -hmm. removal. In the state of South Dakota, I know because I'm friends with former Cheyenne River Sioux Chief Joe Brings Plenty, that the lieutenant governor of the state started a child foster care company that because of higher reimbursements from the government for native children placements, has created a $90 million foster care industrial complex in South Dakota, and that's just one state. So there's a lot of work to be done if ICWA survives. And so my question is, what can be done to make sure that it's properly enforced and fully enforced all over the country to protect that kind of abuse that still takes place? Well, I'll, I'll get the conversation rolling. We we got to take the profit out of child protective services and adoption. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no need for profiting off of, off of the future of children. That's number one, and that's the problem in South Dakota, right then and there. Other ideas? The, I'm glad you said it in that way, the profit. That, that is exactly how we see that as well. And the focus isn't on healing the family. You come into child protection often because there has been a crisis. There's lots of times where there hasn't been a crisis. Um, it's worker bias as well that you might be end up in, with a child protection case. I, I still look at it how we don't value children and mothers, because if we did, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. They would, in our communities and philosophies on how we function as, as a community, children are in the center of that. Our people that are in crisis are, you know, is because of their disconnect and, and often, this is why active efforts are so important is getting them to resources that will uh, facilitate healing for them and get that reconnection. Reconnection to themselves of who they are and who they belong to and their purpose in life. And we don't hear the words healing. We don't hear um, encouragement. There's so many things that are, that it's, it's, it sadly is about money. Money's given to foster parents instead of to the mother or the, and the family. Mm -hmm. Um, to use so that they can um, stay in a house, a home, and not get evicted because they don't have, can't pay rent. Um, th there could be ways to to st stabilize families, and we're not looking at that at all. We stabilize foster parents, mm. 
And then beyond that, the, many of our children are hurt in foster homes. And that, that all of that goes along with not being willing to put the money in prevention or put the money at the be beginning of that process of, of, um, of a case that needs, the money needs to go there and not afterwards to some institution as the gentleman spoke about or in foster homes. Uh, last, last words. I think the only other thing I would add is it has to be more than Indian country that cares about Indian country. And so we know yes. for representation in elected office right now, we're 3% of the national population and we have just under 200 elected officials nationwide. So to reach parity, we would actually need to be closer to 18,000 represented individuals. Uh, so that's, it's a big gap to make up. And so that means that all of the people that are making these laws and funding these policies and ensuring that they're actually upheld and carried through are not people who are of our community. And so we need more than just our community to care about this. And it starts with documentaries, it starts with discussions like this, but we, and as a call to action, as you leave here, the conversation has to continue beyond today. It has to continue tomorrow for the first day of this hearing. It has to continue to the last day of this hearing, and regardless of the outcome, it needs to be letters to the editor, change in curriculum for all levels, from school all the way up to college. In Maine, we had a law that was passed for Wabanaki Studies, but there was no funding or no mechanism to see that all of the school districts implemented this. And so while it was a wonderfully intentioned law, if there's no way to carry it out, we have generations that aren't learning what this accurate history is. So again, we need more than Indian country to care about Indian country to ensure that we really are able to, to make these changes happen, whether it was overturned or not, that we're protecting our communities. Closing. Um, I'll try. <laughs> so um, um, I'm sitting with the two, the dual realities of white supremacist forces trying to become stronger in Massachusetts and throughout this country. And I'm thinking about the UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide and Raphael Lemkin, who invented the word genocide and who felt so strongly that if you destroy a people by taking their culture, it constitutes genocide, Article 2, Clause E of the Convention. And how what's going on right now, this attempt to take children from Indian country, put them in the profit-driven adoption industry, for the purpose of making them white, it really is, it's the extension of replacement theory. <coughs> it's, it's just, it's breathtaking what is really underneath this case. And so we all have to be engaged. Um, yeah, it's hard to, you know, sum it up in, in, in just a few words, but um, there has always been talk that, you know, Indian Child Welfare Act does need to get looked at and does need to get updated because it really meets the enforcement factors um, that we're talking about, you know, because when things go awry and, you know, even in those, those, those PR um, campaigns that I talked about, it, it usually starts out with the Indian Child Welfare Act not being complied with in the first place. Right, you know, and um, this still happens across this country. And e even if you watch the full length Dawn Land, uh, which, you know, First Light is the short of, um, there's even a judge that mentions in there, you know, we figured that somebody would tell us when NICWA applied and nobody told us, so we didn't do anything. That's a judge, right, that's saying that. Um, that that's a, a, a sincere problem that uh, you know we need to really look at. That the Indian Child Welfare Act is absolutely needed. It is the gold standard, and the only time that things go wrong with it is when it's not properly complied with. That's a mic drop moment. Am I right or wrong? Thank you so much for being here tonight as part of this conversation. 
when you're listening to the proceedings or reading the news coverage of the hearing, please think about writing a letter to the editor or, or at least having a conversation with the people that you work with, that you study with. And thank you so much to the IOP for having this conversation. Thank you.